and it is podcast number three with Bridger and Charlie. And guest today. And our guest is the big Snoop Dogg, who is on the phone. What a shocker, huh? Typical of John to get a phone call right in the middle of something. That was somebody who was born in the year of the fork. The year of the fork. Now that's a fork. Okay. That's a place to begin, isn't it? So, John, since you got the phone call in the middle of your introduction, what is the year of the fork? 1969. Okay, war across the USA. Oh yeah. So, for people who haven't met. John, out in the listening world. Is that too loud, John? It, it, it either is or it isn't. Then it's not. So you're fine with it? Mm-hmm. All right. The year of the fork, 1969. What is today? The Beatles will tell you. Oh, boy. So it's it's the Grandmaster Day of Helter Skelter here on podcast number three. And another phone call. Turn your phone off and be a professional. We're doing a radio show about Helter Skelter and you're calling in the middle of it. All right, turn the turn the ringer off. Okay. Then you'll call them back when we're done. We got cease to exist on, John. Now there's a connection here. Year of the Fork, cease to exist. Who are we listening to here? The Son of Man. The Son of Man. And for those who don't know your encrypted language, a.k.a. They just have to know. Oh, boy. <laughs> Bridger, do you know? Yeah. Who is this? Seaman. Uh, the Seaman, the Charles Manson. Is that right, John? And what's the claim on this song? I think that's a good place to begin. Is there a claim on this song? The Beach Boys. No, actually, it's not that one. It's not that one. Which one is it? I think it is that one. I'm your kind, I'm your kind, right? Yeah, actually, it is. Cease yeah. to exist, and Dennis changed it to cease to resist. Okay. And so Manson and them were mad that Dennis did that, aren't they? Or were? They were and they are. Supposedly. Right. Hmm. Those beach boys always ripping people off. So, you're the fork. Today is what, August 8th? We're doing the podcast one day earlier than usual for the weekly schedule. We usually do it on Thursday. Bridger and I thought last week that today was tomorrow. Interesting, huh? Have you ever done that? Well, technically it is, because the only thing that happened on the 8th actually was the Last Supper. Okay, the Last Supper. Wasn't that in, like, Jerusalem or something? I hope not. So, Bridger, you're unaware of the connotation here? Uh, e well. What's the Last Supper, John? How would you define it? That all the victims ate their last supper at El Coyote at 8 p.m. on August 8, 1969. Okay. What they have for dinner? Ask Noguchi. Does he actually know? Because I have actually I don't that. know. Because we've been there multiple times at this point. Now, what happened to... Wasn't there like a movie set there or something? In El Coyote. <laughs> No, it's Spawn. Spawn Ranch. Oh, there was no movie set there. At Spawn, yeah. Oh, okay. 
Well, that's where the family lived was right. in the movie set. Yeah. Was ba- was it an abandoned, John? No. Was it so they still shot movies there from time to time? The studios or was well, it just Well, that's why the family was in a number of movies shot there. Okay. They were actually in studio Ram, movies or Ram, so they were just like Ram, extras that never left the set. Ramrodder. Ramrodder. That was a studio movie? Well, I don't know what else made it. Well, you know, it could be a indie movie at the time or something. Right? Because there was there was there was about three of them. There was an Al Adamson one, right? Or keep talking. I'm just turning you up a little bit so I can hear you better. Um, okay, so they made some movies, but the Last Supper. Technically, who all was at the Last Supper? There was Sharon, Abigail, J. Voitek. So the three of them. Four. Four. Okay. So, all right. And do we sit at the table where... Unless some it's that, trendy imposters glom it away, right. which happened two years ago. I remember that. It's kind of become a new thing, huh? But when was your first Last Supper? 79 on the 10th anniversary. Okay. And how did this idea come about? The year I was born. Interesting. Make no invocation of Bridger. Yeah. We were finishing Manson family movies at the ranch that we had in Chatsworth. Hmm. And so me and whatever part of the cast was living in Chatsworth went to El Coyote and recreated The Last Supper. Okay. But you didn't know what they had to eat, even though you recreated the scene. What did you guys have to eat? Was the cast you usually? What did you guys? Blue have? or gr- oh, I only eat blue or green tamales usually. Well, you used to have chicken enchiladas, right? Maybe it's recently switched to that. All right, so you guys were having blue tamales for your last supper, and what took place? Photographs and talking about it. And did the waitress or well, there wasn't, staff there know? There wasn't video then, so there was just stills that I still have somewhere. Right. So perhaps, John, we need to give you an uninterrupted proper inter- introduction for uh, our listening folks who aren't familiar with your your uh, deeds. <laughs> Dirty deeds. Right. Uh, beyond joy and evil. Right, your art noise music band that you started what year? Well, sort of in '66, but it wasn't actually called Beyond Joy and Evil until '74. Oh, what was it called before? King Mama Screaming, I suppose. Okay, so you've you've been doing that, which is uh, I can pull some of that up and then describe your your career as a filmmaker so to speak how it well, started the, ab- the absolute first movie was Manson Family Movies right and that started how well I was going to make this mo- well there was this girl who was who called herself King Hog, and then they got changed to King Mama. And I met her when she was 16, and I was probably 18 or something. Okay. And and she had this obnoxious friend who was either called Son of Hog or Prince Gwonk. That's pretty hard. And I was g- going to make a movie about all this ridiculous stuff that they were doing. Yeah. Like going over to somebody's house and going in the closet and shitting in boots and spitting on furniture and licking things. So you're going to make a movie just about 
what the typical antics of well that was called weenies on your porch and it got partially made oh really but it was actually made pieces of it were actually made after a lot of the manson movie was made and what what stage of production is weenies on your porch in at the moment i'd like to completely recut it is it i've never even seen it it it's on imdb for unknown reasons right but you know i've known you for quite a while and i've never even heard or seen that one so is it a, do you even have it on video right now yeah okay so what are we hearing right now it's a little clip from beyond joy and evil Beyond Joy and Evil in 1974. Okay, so this is one of the earlier incarnations of it. So you did the film, you did Manson Family Movies, which took how long? Ten years. All right. Well, and it, it actually got made because I was in New York and saw Pink Flamingos at the Elgin when it first came out at midnight. Yeah. And it was sort of shocked and amazed that a lot of my scenes are in that movie that your scenes were in Pink Flamingos well John Waters had had Divine doing the exact same things that King Hog and Son of Hog were doing and you talked to John Waters about this well, later on hmm. had he seen your movie before he made Pink Flamingos of course not okay so there was a correlation well I mean Pink Flamingos has made a number of years before Manson family movies right so when you say a number but, of but that caused me to realize I had to make a different movie hmm. so I decided to make a Manson movie okay oh so I see so the the weenies on my porch was somewhat similar to Pink Flamingos and that's when you went more into the Manson Family Movies project. Is that fair to say? Well, I mean, I suppose that those two movies... Well, those movies are sort of made concurrently. Right. But the only one that was really finished was Manson Family Movies. Okay. And you've seen Manson Family Movies, Bridger, right? Yep. Right. And in fact, we were, you and I, in a way, were instrumental in providing part of the soundtrack for uh, Manson Family Movies. Is that right, John? You care to elaborate on that? There's a connection there. Well, that you engineered Beyond Joy and Evil, I suppose. Well, I did do that as well, but there's the STF connection. Which, basically, if I hadn't met Bridger, and the whole situation of the houses hadn't occurred, I don't think STF would have made it to Manson Family Movies. You think? STF being Sloppy Teddy Freaks. And the song being, what's the name of the song? Die, Bitch. Right. So let's pull that one up and take a listen. Because you, uh, you actually went and redid the soundtrack, is that right? Well, it was being commercially released at the time. Oh, yeah, that's right. So you went and you heard this song. Let's find it here. And how did that, how did that deal go down eventually? Because I didn't quite know. Did you just say to Sean or Sunil or do you remember? Well, Tom's actually signed off on it. Oh, Tom's the one that did it. I didn't know that. So, here's the song, which they may not have known what they were getting into. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't know? So, here's the Sloppy Titty Freaks, and this song appears at what part of the movie? The murders, of course. The murders of who? Sharon. Oh, Sharon. And here we go. Sharon Tate, on Helter Skelter, 
In the year of the fork, as you call it, right? Oh, I certainly didn't invent that. Who invented it? Probably Bernadette Dorn. Yeah. And so this song, aptly titled Die, <laughs> you put during the murder scene of Tate, uh, who else? I always forget the names. You know how I am Jay with names. Boy, Tech, Abigail. Right. And did Tom or them really understand the, the content of the movie they were signing up for? I don't know. Right. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so. <laughs> Although Tito, who called at the beginning of this, didn't approve of it. Tito didn't like this song. Well, he he said it was too modern for the movie. Well, I kind of almost felt the same way because it was like a jump in time, but but it was but it was also one of ten pieces in a sound montage. Right. Because Beyond Joy and Evil was in that also. Oh, is that right? And Helter Skelter itself was in it. But oh, you be, used but, that? But because of the well, because of the copyright thing. It's it, there is, it's leak through. Oh, I see. Yeah. So okay. So that makes sense. So when I remastered some of those, that was for the movie then. No. That was just for remastering. Well, it had never been mastered. All right. So it was just not even remastering. It was just mastering it. Period. Well, I mean, it was recorded by hanging two mics plugged into a reel-to-reel -reel from the ceiling. Right. Right, that was the Beyond Joint Evil back in the... Okay, so... Bridger, you got anything you want to bring up? Anything lingering in your mind? Not presently. Okay. So... That was the Titty Freaks. Lovely example. Um, where I saw them the first time was down the street from here. At the house? No. Where? Paladino's. Oh, was that the triple, triple billing that night? Yeah. So that was, that was actually a show I actually played as well. That was the Blumpkins, right? Which was you, Sean, Shamblin, and Nick. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Yep. And then Sloppy Titty Freaks. Yep. And yep. then I came up from Long Beach, skipped an extra job. I didn't even check out. Me and this drummer I'd only played with once drove from Long Beach without telling the directors or anyone we were leaving the movie set. Came up here, played a 40-minute set, drove back. And still got paid? Still got paid. They didn't even know we left. It wasn't even like a break or anything, but... So I think that was the only show. And that is the show that we have on video. That right. you have right now, the VHS. That I haven't watched yet. Right. So, okay. And so here's here's Bobby, Bobby Beausoleil. Is it fair to say Bobby kind of set off the whole helter-skelter chain of events? Like, what was the initial spark that set everything off in the the Manson family, as Bugalosi calls them, family murders? Is it Bobby that really set it off, or was there more before, in your opinion? Well, there was all kinds of things going on. I mean, it was mainly Tex Watson's drug deals. Right. Tex was dealing drugs. As was Jay and Wojtek. Right. So, how that had been going on long before the night of the Last Supper, Helter Skelter, right? Yeah. And that was just kind of a, that was almost a given in the dynamics of the group that was hanging out that there was uh, drug dealings going on and the the uh, hanging with the Harley dudes and the 
the uh, drug parties with the musicians and the girls and everything, right? That was kind of the typical day-to-day -day operations of hanging out and partying. Well, I mean, it was slumming movie stars and rock stars and hippies and right. the Manson family. Exactly. And so, how did Bobby get involved? What happened with Bobby? Because that was that started before the tape murders. Bobby. Well, everybody was initially in Hate Ashbury. In Hate Ashbury, everyone was up there. Yeah. Just hanging out. Well, Bobby was living with Ken at the house called the Russian Embassy and starting to make Lucifer Rising. Hmm. And Charlie and Sadie and were living at the. I think on Cole Street. In San Francisco. In Haight Ashbury. Okay. And Mary was in Berkeley. This is before. Before. That's how they got linked up with Bobby? This no, is... they met... They, I don't know that they ran into Bobby up there. Oh. But there was the, the free clinic parties, which that play was about. Oh, really? The musical in North Hollywood the other night? No, the other one. Oh, okay. Which I don't... Now I don't remember the name of it. Right. Yeah, so they all were in San Francisco long before the first... Uh, prosecuted murder. Well, I mean, it was before the what was called the Manson family was even in L.A. Right. So they were all in San Francisco. So they migrated and they were living with Ken. No, only Bobby was. Living with Ken. And then he moved down there and he was part of that operation. No. What? Who? Bobby? Yeah. Bobby was living with Ken because Ken had the movie Lucifer Rising and what happened Jimmy Page backed out on making the soundtrack something Jimmy happened Jimmy Page did make the soundtrack but Ken didn't like it okay he didn't like it so then Bobby was brought in yeah and well Bob Bobby wasn't brought in to do the soundtrack he was brought in to play Lucifer oh in the movie did he? Well, no. There's the only piece of footage that exists is Invocation of My Demon Brother. Right. And Ken, of course, claims that basically he shot the whole movie and Bobby stole it and buried it in Barker. Okay. But sorry. Bobby claims that only a few minutes were shot. Hmm. With him and in there, it. And there was nothing to steal. And Got maybe it. you can expound on who this Bobby person is for our listeners. Well, Bobby Bosley was, and I'm pretty sure this is the situation, Bobby was supposed to become the next black pope. Is that That's fairly accurate to say, right? No. Well, he was in some sort of... What is accurate to say, John? Right. He was, he was in a number of rock bands, and that's what he was into. Okay. So how and, did, and that's where Ken met him. Because there was this church that was trying to be hip, so they were having these happenings. Okay. So how did he end up down there uh, on the west side of the valley inhabiting an old movie studio? with Manson and Tex. Well, I mean, you have to, you have to finish with the, the free clinic parties. All right. Where Colonel Tate was there. Really? Abigail was there. Abigail's parents were there. Now, I'll clarify, Colonel Tate is Sharon's dad. Yeah. Okay. So he was at these parties and, in San Francisco. And Charlie and Sadie were at them. Okay. But the interesting point here being established is there's a Tate connection before they were even in Los Angeles. Is that what you're saying, basically? Yeah. Well, I mean, according to that play, right. the whole thing was about an affair between Abigail and Charlie. 
Mm. Abigail? Yeah. Not Tate? No. Mm. Well, Sharon wasn't ever at these parties. Right. But her dad was. She was. Well, was she, she even famous then? Yeah, but she was making movies in Italy and married to Roman. So Abigail Folger, the heiress to the Folger Coffee Company, was supposedly having an affair with Charles Manson. According to that play. Okay. And how much credence do you give that play? I don't know. I wanted to interview the woman who wrote it, but I haven't. Right. Is it plausible? Well, there's always been rumors that her father had something to do with the murders because he was outraged at Abigail's behavior mm. in a number of directions. Her father being probably the CEO of Folger Coffee at the time? Well, he owned it. Right. Peter Folger. Okay. So he wasn't happy that Abigail's out slumming it, basically. The best part of waking up. It's Folger's Abigail Folger. That's right. Yeah. Who knew? And one time when we were at Barker Ranch, there was a cardboard box on a hillside that was a Folger's coffee box. Really? Someone planted it there, you think? I don't know. Or maybe it manifested there from all the energy around it. So, but then after these free clinic parties, I mean, they were to raise money for the free clinic. Right. And Abigail's, according to the play, Abigail's mother was the one who was t totally into trying to help the hippies and all that stuff. And Peter thought it was ridiculous. Right. And Colonel Tate endorsed this? Or why was he even there then? Presumably he did, I don't know. Huh. Okay, so the free clinics, and how does all this get transitioned, transitioned into Los Angeles? Well, Bobby ended up going to LA one time. Well, he told Ken that he needed, well, according to Ken's version, he, Bobby said that he needed money to buy equipment for the band in LA. So hmm. Ken gave him the money and he and bought him a van. Oh, really? And so then Bobby came back and then there was this plastic, this big plastic square thing in the hallway and the dog t tore it open and it was a bale of marijuana. So Ken threw Bobby out. Hmm. And then Ken said that Bobby broke in and stole all the footage of the movie and buried it at Barker. And so then Bobby ended up just moving to L.A. I see. He was originally from Santa Barbara. And then he was living with Gary Hinman. Right. And then there was the, the house behind the Malibu feed bin, the spiral staircase. Right. That me and Jason filmed. That's supposedly and, where Clem cut off his penis. Yeah, and right. there was all these insane parties there. Right, sounds pretty insane. That you know, and that's that, and that's probably where what was becoming the Manson family ran into Bobby at the spiral staircase. And then they all moved to Gary's house, but that which was really small. Right. And then somebody found out about the Spawn Ranch. <laughs> Okay. So the first murders Bobby was involved with was at the Hinman residence, right? Yeah. Right. And that residence was actually formerly Walt Disney's residence? No. Well, which house was that? The La Biancas. La Bianca. And there was a murder there as well, wasn't there? Two. Okay. Because I just recently ran into a guy who made a fairly in-depth... Uh, documentary sort of thing pointing out that some of the murders happened at one of Disney's former residences the which one was it La Bianca. the La Bianca murders Haunted Mansion opened 
on this day back in uh, 69. Today? Yeah. And they had an advertisement saying, we have 999 souls, we need one more. And that was the advertisement that was running for today. And the Beatles also had the photo taken for Abbey Road on this day, crossing the, um, the uh, checkered road in, in London. So there, it kind of ties in this, loosely ties together Disney, Haunted Mansion, looking for souls with the Beatles on another ocean away. It's all kind of this weird uh, synchronicity of events. If it's pure coincidence or was it more uh, planned out than well, that? Then they, August 8th and 9th. 1945 right which was dropping the bomb on Hiroshima and, and then ac according to a bizarre story um, the spear of destiny right was found in a bombed out bank vault by US soldiers who handed it to General Patton and supposedly the second that it was in Patton's hands the bomb was dropped in the U.S. when the war. And this is all in 45? Yeah. Right. So in that sense of the case, for some reason 8-9 has some sort of spiritual, ritualistic and then the weirdness er the tied to it. The earliest thing was the Battle of Anton Trinople. Which was what? I think it was 500 and something, hmm. 575, I don't know, I'm not sure what year, but it was on August 8th and 9th. That has something to do with Caesar? It was between the Goths the, and the Romans. Right. And the Goths won. Right. And they marched on Rome and sort of trashed everything. Mm -hmm. And then whoever was Caesar at the time said, if you just get out of here, we'll give you Spain. Hmm. Which resulted in the... In the what? Well, the Aryan-looking Spanish. Hmm. Castili the Castilians. Got it. So eight nine, is it is it magical? That's too bad the magic well, man isn't here. Jack Hollywood thought it was just a bad date. <laughs> right, a cursed date like Friday the Thirteenth. Because the Jesse James Hollywood situation was on, on August eighth. Is that right? And what part of the situation? The kidnapping? The, no, the murder at midnight. Oh, the mur they did the murder at... Is that right? Did not know that. Well, Ryan Hoyt and that other guy. Right. I mean, it was just... Well, that the Jesse James Hollywood thing was just total Manson parallels. But were they aware of it? Jack seems to have been somewhat of a word. I don't have any idea if anybody else was. Hmm. You yeah. know about the Jesse James Hollywood Bridger? So that was what, drug dealers in Canoga Park? Well, it was weed. This, a bunch of kids selling weed. Right. And one of them, um, someone thought somebody ripped somebody off, so they kidnapped one of the rich kids or something? Nobody was rich. Well, the... I mean, there was this... I'm not going to remember all the names, but there, right. was, there was this guy who, who had been, like, buying from Jesse James. Right. And he owed Jesse James a bunch of money. And he'd been in and out of jail a lot. Jesse had? No. Oh, the kid. Or the dude. The other guy. Right. 
His younger stepbrother was the one who got kidnapped because they were going to... Hmm. Con- well, the, the guy that owed Jesse James money, instead of paying him, went over to his house and broke all the windows out and stuff like that. I see. So they went to get him, and then they ran into his younger brother. Hmm. But then they ended up, like, more or less partying with the younger brother. Right. But then this one guy who was like an extreme sycophant to Jesse, hmm. who was the Tex Watson of the situation, decided that what Jesse actually wanted was for him to off the kid. Hmm. Even though that's not what Jesse wanted. Well, I don't think it was. Right. So what well, happened then, to the then, kid? Well, Ryan Hoyt and this other guy killed him in the woods near Santa Barbara on August 8th and at midnight. And they left him up there, right? Well, they buried him, right. but not very well. And then they went looking for Jesse, and he had to run to where, Brazil? Well, Jesse, like Charlie, was off with his girlfriend elsewhere right. when this happened. And then there's the whole thing about the phone call. Oh, and really? It, I wish I could think of everybody's name. It's Ryan Hoyt's the one who actually did the killing. Right. And then his sort of assistant. And Jesse well, was well, this, nowhere around all this. Right. Well, this all, well, some of this came out. We had a dinner party. Me and Marlon, who did Manson, the Manson Now book. Right. Like, well, Alto Marlin was well. Marlin knew Mark Hollywood. Mark Hollywood, who was Pamela Anderson's boyfriend at some point. Oh boy! And he before Tommy showed her the goods. Well, it was right before Howard Stern, actually. Okay. But he was in jail because of some incident that happened on Pamela's property where the, a neighbor, according to him, attacked him. But he, whatever happened, he got put in prison behind it. And he was in with the guy that assisted Ryan Hoyt. Hmm. And he said that this, I mean, I wish I could remember the names. Right. But he said that I mean, I think his name was Jesse something. Hmm. Two Jessies. But according to Mark Hollywood, this guy said that what the phone call actually was, was Jesse saying, leave the kid alone, he's not going to talk. But but for some reason, right after getting that call, Ryan decided that he was going to off the kid. Right. So... The short version is some guy owed Jesse James money for drug deals. Uh, That guy who owed the money went and broke, vandalized Jesse James' property. Yeah. So they went and ran into Jesse, the kid who who was... uh, The younger brother. The younger brother of the vandal. Kidnapped him, but they ended up liking the kid, partying with him. There was a phone call where Jesse said, leave the kid alone, but this Ryan Hoyt and his accomplice decided to do otherwise. Yeah. And Jesse got pinched for it, basically, where he was on the run for, what, two or three years? No, I think it was more like eight years. That's quite a while. Now, tying this back to Manson, the reason we brought this up... Well, I mean, the other thing is, is is that... I mean, it's just completely bizarre that somebody's last name is Hollywood and their case gets sold out to Hollywood before the trial by the DA. Right. So do you think there was some setting up of the situation beforehand? Nah. Was the black hand at work? Well, the thing that happened in the Manson case is that Sadie's testimony to the grand jury was 
on the front page of the LA Times the next day, and a week later was the first book on the Manson case. So someone had done quite a bit of work. No, they just threw money around. <laughs> right. So there was a lot of money involved. Now, I've always kind of been of the opinion uh, the then administration of the U.S., Nixon mainly, or the people behind Nixon, didn't care much for the hippies and were looking for a way to um, destabilize the movement to some degree. And they used this Manson situation the murder situation here to kind of uh, make the hippies look really bad and use that to uh, change public opinion the evil hippies is that is that a fair assessment with the media uproar and well i mean it's what happened whether it was an intentional government thing is another thing right but there's stories about the idea that manson was let out on a leash and there's all kinds of stories about him blatantly violating parole hmm. and the, in front of the police and they never do anything. As if Manson knew that that was the situation? As if he had protection. Right. Or he just, or he may have thought he was untouchable. And Got it. Because of the way th things were going down. Now, which prison is he in right now? Corcoran. Where's that? I don't know. Where is Corcoran? It's north of Bakersfield. Okay. And he's not getting out. They were all put on the death penalty, but the overturning of the death penalty in, what, 72? Turn Something the, like that. Turn their sentences into life sentences. And then in 74, California reinstated the death penalty. So they can't actually put him back on death row after the fact but in the court proceedings they never convicted Manson of actually killing anybody did they he was convicted of first a bunch of counts of first degree murder he was but did they show they, that well, he be, because of the conspiracy law right but as far as hand to hand he was the hand that ended someone else's life he didn't actually it wasn't shown in the courts that that had occurred. Well, I mean, except for all these people who don't know anything whatsoever about the case, nobody's ever said that Charlie actually killed any of those people. Right. But there's a lot of public opinion out there that, you know, some people listening to this may have that of view, but Manson himself didn't actually pull the trigger. Well, I mean, what it's finally come down to is that Tex in the Tate situation, Tex killed absolutely everyone. Right. And Sadie probably didn't kill anyone. Hmm. And Patricia helped kill Wojtek and Abigail. She was like a assisted Tex. Right. And then the LaBianca won the next night. Leslie after Abigail was dead, Leslie was handed the knife. Hmm. To get her hands dirty. Yeah. Right. And so she stabbed a corpse a bunch of times. Right. A dead corpse. Which is kind of an eerie thing to do. But now Bobby, how how much prior was the uh the uh Folger murders? Was it two weeks before? The Folger murders are part of the Tate murders. Okay, which ones were the ones Bobby were a part of? Gary Hinman. Okay, the Hinman murders. The Maxwell murders. House murders. Right. So the Hinman murders were about, what, two weeks before? It was probably two months. Two months before. And I've heard the theory that some of the girls thought that by doing what looked like copycat murders, the cops might think that... Uh, it wasn't Bobby and let Bobby go, thinking they had the wrong person. Some of the girls probably thought that. Right. But that's not what happened. 
So did Bobby ever see the light of day after being arrested for the Hinman murders? Well, he did a lot of really stupid stuff. Right. But once they nabbed him, he's been in ever since, huh? Yeah. Right. And the Lucifer Rising soundtrack that he recorded was actually done from within prison? Well, what a lot of people don't know is that Clem is on that also. And it was recorded in Tracy. Right. Oh, so Clem was in prison with Bobby. Yeah, and they... I have audio tapes of a concert that had Clem's band and Bobby's band. In the prison? Yeah. Okay. And Bobby and Clem played guitar on Lucifer Rising. Right. And Ken ultimately used that for Lucifer Rising and not the Jimmy Page version. Correct? Yeah. So... Although there is the Jimmy Page version of Lucifer Rising, and Ken always claimed it didn't exist, and so I showed it to him. And what did Ken do? Well, then he started, you know, saying I was, you know, I tried this shot and that shot for whatever reason, and doing an analysis of it, since he couldn't exactly deny it anymore. Hmm. So you kind of called Ken out on that now Manson was a fairly still is active uh, musician correct yeah what do you think the coolest song is do you know it's your favorite I mean, there's a number of things on a lie. Right, like which one? We'll cease to exist, Garbage Dump. Oh yeah, I like Garbage Dump. Let's play that. I think that's a great environmental song, right? Because he's kind of confronting the idea of this might not necessarily be garbage, right? Well, they're eating it. Who's they? Oh, the family. Garbage dump. Right. Oh, garbage dump. So when they were living at Spawn Ranch... They were going down and this is the song here. I think the line is you can feed the world with my garbage dump, right? Yeah. Now that's pretty interesting because now we got all these green hipsters running around talking about saving the world and all this stuff and and where do you think the Green Party originated? I don't know. Do you know? I used to have a pin for it. Oh, yeah? From where? Nazi Germany. Oh, boy. That's probably a whole nother podcast, though. Yeah, probably. But, so Manson and the the Manson ladies and the, the guys were going down and pillaging the dumpsters behind the grocery stores and feeding off of that basically and that was what they were doing for a long time huh yeah and I got a ride from these girls with a step van in the Sierras and they had parked in back of a fancy restaurant in Colorado for months right and that's all they ate for months just the leftovers from the fancy food yeah well that's fancy So, today's Helter Skelter, what do you have to say, John, anything? Well, I mean, there's a lot of people who think it's, from a Manson family point of view, politically incorrect to call a, to turn the thing into a holiday and call it Helter Skelter after the Bugs book and theories. Right. But to me, it's, a, a vicious satire on mass culture combined with a joke and Dada. Right. How so? Well, I mean, that's rather obvious. But for the less. Keen, some people don't get it, though. Some man. people won't get it. Could you, like, break it down? Digest that for. It's 
basically just a joke. Right. The it's turning mass culture on its ass. Right. Well, where did they come up with the name Helter Skelter? Where did who come up with it? I don't think Bridger is as familiar with it as I might be. So why don't you answer that? Well, Helter Skelter was the Beatles song, and that was what Bugliosi ran with was a Manson. Well, you describe it, John. You're better at it. The bug. Well, well some people say that Abel Younger, who was the Attorney General of California at the time, knew that what was really behind all these murders was every movie star's drug deals hmm. and if they really pursued it they would have to put all the movie stars and all the rock stars in prison behind it hmm. and so he ordered the bug to come up with something else hmm. and said so Paul Watkins was going on about Helter Skelter and the bottomless pit and all that stuff right? which may have been something that Charlie mentioned sitting around the campfire one night. Was this Paul and, before or after he turned state's witness? Well, it was all during the trial. Okay. Well, I mean, well, then, then there's the whole thing about because, I mean, I... Paul completely backed up the helter skelter thing of the bugs in court. Right. But Hendrickson said that Paul was forced to do that. Or. And, or he would be charged as an accessory like Sadie and everybody else to hmm. first degree murder. Okay. And so all the, the people in the family, like Linda and Paul, who'd testified for the prosecution mm -hmm. had that over their heads hmm. and supposedly Paul made a tape before he died exposing all of this really so Paul and Hendrickson had said that Paul testified that he was deathly afraid of Clem hmm. and Hendrickson was living at the family during the trial at the ranch filming everything and he has footage of Paul partying with Clem right right after saying that in court which I think I watched the other day what's it called the uh, inside the Manson gang or something yeah. right so the quote unquote mass culture name the Manson family the members of that group wouldn't necessarily call themselves the Manson family. Well, I mean, you can you can be one of these people who's rabidly against what mass culture turns things into. Right. Like Sandra Good. Hmm. And then, and then she'll go wait so off in the other direction. It's ridiculous. Like claiming that they never did drugs and never had sex. Hmm. Complete denial. <clears throat> So you can go in that direction or you can do what I did and right. make fun of it and concoct a holiday called Helter Skelter. Right. Let me see if I have family jams available. Because the interesting part was they all kind of did do a lot of uh, kind of groovy music, a lot of it. Some of it's better than others, but... Like this song, I think is pretty cool. What do you think of this one, John? Well, all of that's really good. Right. Now, is Manson actually on these or no? No. I didn't think so. It's Clem. Oh, it is and Clem. And Clem does Charlie better than Charlie because he was a better singer and a better guitarist. Right. And he thought he was Charlie. Hmm. Now, do you think Charlie had some sort of thing over everybody did they all look up to him or was it more than that well that was the case with some people right was it deliberate or he was just like well 
they're gonna do that anyway. I can't really control them. I mean, like Mel Lyman, he found himself being followed by all these people asking him what to do. Right. Yeah, I wish I had that quote ready. Uh, Manson did an interview where I think it was Rivera, or was it Rivera or somebody else, confronted Manson, did you give the order? And he's like, they came to me and asked me what I would do. I didn't tell them to do anything. I just said, do whatever it is you need, you think you got to do to make it right. You know what I'm talking well, about. I mean, I have a really good idea of what went on between Tex and Charlie before yeah. the Tate thing. What do you think? Well, I mean, you'd have to know the whole, the whole convoluted drug thing. Right. Which involved the uh, Gary Hinman selling bad MDA to the, the biker gang. Right. Which resulted in the bikers going to Spawn Ranch threatening everybody. Right. And... Bobby and I think Bobby, Bruce, Mary and Sadie were decided the way to protect the ranch from these bikers was to go to Gary and get the money back. Right. And Gary was the one who gave I mean the lineage is Gary gave who who to give it to? Tex or Bobby or somebody bunk drugs bad drugs they gave it to the Harley dudes. The Harley dudes come back and go, we want our money back, basically. And then, who from the, the gang goes? Tex? Was it Tex or Bobby? Bobby Tex, go. Tex didn't have anything to do with that one. Okay, so Bobby goes over there with some of the girls. And, and, they, were, and they were driven by Bruce. Right. Who, and who apparently didn't do anything. That's all he did. Hmm. And then he gets, and he got convicted of conspiracy to commit first degree murder for just driving them over there. Right. But they were going there to get the money back from the bad drugs that these Hinmans, the kind of Hollywood bourgeois, so to speak, had ripped them off. Or, and then the, because uh, they were under threat from the biker gang, which isn't fun, right? And then there was the tax and the lots of papa thing i don't know about that well that was a a black guy that tex did the well he left the girls in lots of papa's living room bridger you were looking up at gary versus the magic man <laughs> yeah had one of the greatest looks. Just to digress, John. What do you think of Gary versus the Magic Man? Any comment? Retarded degeneracy. Right. You know, I could play a quick excerpt from it. Cause we're we're running about at our end of the pod. Can let's just hear a little bit of it. I think the best part is is when uh, and if anybody's listening to this who really uh, wants to know what happened they're going to hate you right well finish it's it, it can be endless I know that's the problem we, we try to fit it all in one hour maybe we'll have to do a follow up later I mean, this could be a double feature on the podcast, right? Don't you think? I mean, we're just touching the surface here. There's so many details in the case, what really happened. You got the, the Harley gangs. You got the, uh, the uh, Hollywood hipsters, so to speak, who think they can just get away with whatever because they're hipsters, and the Harley dudes are like, I don't think so. And then... Uh, the family, so to speak, the the Manson group, uh, kind of caught in the middle there, right? Yeah. Now Tate, Sharon Tate, real quick, 
was in a movie called what eye of the devil or 13 or 13 and her last movie was called 13 chairs 13 chairs which i found on youtube and it wasn't easy if if this was all some kind of hollywood potentially satanic ritual was roman aware of it well i mean there's that diane young woman who was in marlin's book right who has that whole thing about the roman orchestrating the whole thing but she won't back anything up mm. she just says it yeah Interesting. And then, she, then if you try to get her to name names, she says, I'm not a snitch. Right. Yeah, because Sharon kind of did fit the profile of a almost a perfect sacrifice. She was young, very pretty. Uh, okay, actress. You know, okay, not, not... What do you think? What do you think of her acting skills? ever really paid a great deal of attention to it right yeah, she was okay but you know anyway today is helter skelter i think we're about over on time for the podcast but like you said john there is so much more isn't there well, i mean that's hardly any of it i know perhaps we'll have to revisit this in a special podcast right what do you think about that? With the pod people. With the pod people. And perhaps we could even do on location for some of it, right? With mm -hmm. video, maybe. That'd be a real treat. So anyway, Bridge, It's it was been a darker one for episode number three. What do you think about that? Sure. <laughs> not, a, not a whole lot to say. Huh? John, what do you think? It's podcast number three. Should we go out on a song? What song do we like? Got any ideas? We oh, could you do know, the same you, one that we always do, the one we did last time. Right, but I just thought of one, if I can find it here. Do I have it? Yes, I do. Just just because I brought up the magic man I don't know which song is their best but everyone loves this group can you name this band John put the headphones on I know you love this band you know who it is Talking to the mic. Happy joy and death. Happy joy and death. All right. So that's been the podcast. Thanks, John, for being the guest on number three. Right. Okay. Bridger, any, any last words for the podcast today? Nothing. See you next time, right? See you next time. Stay See safe. You. Stay On safe. August 8th. August 8th, 2012. Peace. Happy joy in life.